so there's something really weird. Um, no, I mean, clearly there's something very weird about you, but in a great way. It was what makes you a good guest. But there's something that um, I talk about a lot on this podcast, which is um, the inner voice of people. T to me, like even if you can get rid of this idea of consciousness by proving from an MRI that you have made the decision to uh, move your finger before you ever knew that you made that decision and all you're doing is backwards recording what it was that you did. To me, though, the, there is kind of this Jungian idea that curiosity is the spirit or it is the soul. It's the thing that says, oh, that's captured my attention. And I refer to this oftentimes as the daemon, you know, that, that people have this voice inside of their head that says, go this direction. And as much as you'd like to ignore it, you can't. It appears to me that you are driven deeply by your daemon. But as I describe this, does it become a repellent idea to you that there's some inner creature like a daemon? Uh, no, I mean, I mean, I don't make any separation between me. You know, I am me. So I am my conscious brain and my unconscious brain. When I, I mean, I taught myself a version of mathematics when I was four or five, which I didn't really understand was a fairly useful but I couldn't explain it to anyone. So that's one of the reasons why I ended up in the, in, the, in, the, in the learning difficulties class, because people said you can't count. I was like, well, no, I just invented a new system. It's much better than that. Why would I do that? And, um, and the problem is that the way I taught myself to do that, I can solve mathematical problems in my subconscious brain faster than my conscious brain. So when the teachers were saying to me, please explain what you did, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's like, I don't know. And it's not like I'm not a savant, right? I've got no skills really when it comes to like numbers or anything like that. I just know how to, I think in graphs, I guess. I think in, I think in, I don't know, don't, I don't know what it is. I think in some kind of way that gives me insights that occasionally I can distill out to people. Um, and I have no problem with my unconscious brain because the unconscious brain, I mean, I think in some ways, um, I really like talking to Yasha. I mean, he's very, very precise and very, very, um, I like talking to him because he can take a lot of my unconscious thoughts the way I think about it and actually puts them into the right order so I understand what I mean, right? So, whereas I just have this splurge of, I think like, reality is like this, but I lack the formal, um, I don't know, education to actually place everything into the right words and the right layering so people understand what I mean. And that can be a big problem. I spend a lot of time drawing pictures. So I don't think we should worry about our unconscious and subconscious, uh, our conscious brains, because they interact with each other in real time and they're continuously updating each other. And so what we should see is our conscious brain is really a, it's actually an inhibitor. It's like don't, your conscious brain is, I say is, it's actually acting against your curiosity. Right, so your unconscious brain, but you're being taught social constructs, what you've been taught, what language confines you to do. And I am a rebel. If people say, I mean, I wear red trousers and pink shirts and when it wasn't allowed to, now it's boring. <laughs> Paint my, red, my office red or whatever. I walk, to, I walk to work backwards sometimes, right? I, you know, whatever. I like to kind of find novelty in the world because I think that demon you talked about, that curiosity, that is novelty. So what the human brain wants to try and do is minimize its um, surprise. I want to maximize my surprise, but still not die. So, because obviously by minimizing your surprise, you don't get eaten by a predator or run over by a train or whatever, but I still want to, so I try to find ways where I can maximize my surprise. And that gives me enormous satisfaction when I find something new. And I guess that's probably what you're thinking about that, that, that quality that you a absolutely describe. that novelty search is is precisely just the description of what I think is going on there. And recently, I uh, I read a book or a, a paper on the sensorium. I can never pronounce the word, but it was essentially like the theory now that dreams are a way of preventing overfitting, and that when you go to sleep, it's uh, if you can if you can get yourself into a place where you have lots of dreams, it's your brain running through all these different. Um, models that it has and making sure that you aren't saying hey i just saw a hundred pictures of a brown dog and when i see a deer i'm going to confuse that with uh with a dog and by having these patterns and the fact that i now have started pursuing this i can tell you that 
um, I can figure probably I have about two hours in the morning after I wake up where I can I can write down things that I figured out at night that I just have to wait until they come to my conscious mind to be able to put them down. Do you have a similar experience? Is this odd to you? Um, I mean, I'm I don't know. I, I kind of accept all of my unconsciousness and consciousness all at the same time. And I don't sleep that much sometimes. And so when I do get when I, I I've been working on a new theory for time which is a chemist i'm like really wind up all the physicists are like you don't understand time and i'm like but but you can't burn you can't burn stuff reversibly and they're like oh and I, i'm gonna get myself so ostracized from the, the these things at this rate but yeah i'm at the moment i'm trying to understand why the universe is deterministic but undetermined and i and i had a dream the other night when i was thinking about myself on a graph and i was that graph and i was bouncing and around like a tennis ball down the different branches of the graph and what i've realized is that, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Let's just say I'm in a box and all that box, I have got a couple of balls moving around and it's all deterministic. So I understand what's gonna happen, but let's just say it's kind of complicated. So I really need to calculate what's gonna happen next. It's like, a, it's not obvious, but the problem is because people don't understand time and I, I, I think I have a different perspective. When I build my computer to calculate what's going on in the box, when I've just mastered the box, because suddenly, one unit of time goes by, boom, the box suddenly expands. Now suddenly that computer that size is not big enough to do that one. And I think I've realized, and this was a dream I had and wrote down, that the way I can understand how the universe is deterministic but undeterminable is that the box is always getting bigger. So when you've just understood what happened, you've only understood the past. And that's why there is a past going to the future. So that means your event horizon goes like this. So you've got all these ideas and the pyramid going out but and you think you can calculate them and you can capture them, but by the time you've calculated them, another unit of time has gone by and you've just done this. So what does that mean? That means determinism in the universe is fine. Free will is also fine. Well, it's not like no such thing as free will, but agency and consciousness and all that jazz. You can't, you, just because the universe is predictable, or sorry, determined, doesn't mean that anything is predictable because the size of the computer that you need to do it is always bigger than the available universe. That was something I came to just two days ago. Brilliant. And and it, uh, when um, you woke probably up... Probably nonsense, but it's cool. I mean, it, the reason that I think it's brilliant is that it breaks away. I mean, it fits my new hypothesis about overfitting, right? It's, it's that there was a way that you were thinking about the world, and unless I put my brain to sleep where I'm calculating my grocery list and when I have to pick up my daughter and how the work I have to do and stuff for clients then I'm never going to figure those things out. And it ha my brain has to be all the way shut down. And uh, for a long time, I used to try and get there chemically, right? And now I've come to the realization that um, if you do it for me with THC or something like that, you give up night dreams for daydreams. And those daydreams aren't nearly as uh, powerful for overfitting. But to me, if I could have dreams like yours, I mean, I would, I would, I would yeah, swap I mean, I, out mine for yours. They I, sound fun. I do feel, I mean, I've never really taken any illegal, well, not illegal, I've never really taken any, I mean, whether it's legal or not, it doesn't matter. I've never taken substances that much, some here and there, but, but, um, and I think that someone said to me, actually, the weird thing about your brain is you don't seem to need to take drugs to hallucinate, to basically be acting like you're on a trip. And I think that's maybe, and that's kind of a nice thing because I think I can do novelty search about the problem about you taking some chemicals is they, they dissolve yourself, right? So you get, you can see the objects, you, the barrier between you and the objects in the universe get lessened. And that's actually really important because you are continuous objects. But then, but, but when, when that happens, you can then have a new perspective on how the universe is and your, your connection to it. Um, whereas I seem to be able to very, very much maintain my sense of self, but basically move myself around all the connections. And that integration of information is different to the other one. But you never, I did dream of once of having a thing called acid con and then invite some academics. Say, okay, you just got to drop a tab and then give a lecture. But I think that's illegal. And that's not, that's just my personal opinion. My opinion of the <laughs> University really appears. <laughs> You know, but it would be cool to, you know, when, when it's all been deregulated and we're all happy and we know that we're allowed to, to, to have legal whatever, this would be brilliant to have acid con. So a couple of times in this conversation, you have found ways to be like, I just want to let you know, this is my private opinion. This is not <laughs> the office, but you got yourself in trouble um, by making some jokes. And now having spoken to you for a while, I could see how your jokes could get uh, grabbed and thrown into the world 
in a way that you never meant for them to. So the way that we encountered each other is that you were apologizing for having um, turned your, well, having a fun turn of phrase with the way you were going to name your lab. Can you describe that? Yeah, it was actually a joke. So I, but my, I, I've got my lab is called Cronin Lab or Cronin Group after me, and I thought that maybe that's not the, you know, my ego obviously is very important to me and the universe, and it, uh, and I thought, well, my group is doing digital chemistry. It's a big team of people. It's not just about me. I was going to rename the group right or have an additional name. It's digital chemistry, and then I spoke to my subgroups because we've got loads of teams and we have all we, all these different teams, and then. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. <laughs>